in the beginning was the server. So it's 1998. I'm very, very young, just getting my start doing software development. And I've started working for a startup in the Bay Area called WebMD. And, uh, and I'm on the development team at WebMD that's responsible for building their, their web portal. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a picture of the, the development environment that we used. And it's, you know, it, it might be a little overwhelming, but I wanted to explain, you know, going into it, this is just sort of like my conceptual view of, of what our development uh, world looked like. It looked like this. There was a server. There was just a server. It was a big, giant sun server. It was like a six or eight U thing. I mean, in, in my mind, it was like five feet tall, but I'm sure it wasn't that big. But all 40 of the developers on this project, we were all doing our development on the same server. So when I would come in in the morning, the first thing I would do is SSH into this server. We had a wide variety of editors available to us. We had VI and Emacs. We might have had like Pico or something for people who did not enjoy life enough. Uh, and, and so there was SSH, there was my VI instance, and the Java tool set, which I actually rarely interacted with directly because there was a shell script that did most of the building and running for me. And then we used CVS for our concurrent versioning, or for our version control system, right? So my daily workflow looked like this. I would SSH into this box that was pre-configured with all the stuff I needed. And I would check out the file I was gonna be working on and I would open VI and I would edit that and I would build it with the little build scripts that I was given. Now there was a database somewhere in here. You notice that was absent from my diagram because I could naively go about my business without knowing anything other than when I executed SQL, some data came back. We had a DBA and some database administration team somewhere that did stuff. When it came to actually deploying this into production, the production server basically looked the same except only three people had access to it. And so when our development cycle was done, somebody would jar the thing up, move it over, and start it up on the new production server. That was what life was like to me. So let's fast forward a uh, you know, couple of years and a couple of jobs later. So the price of hardware had gone down. Uh, and Sun was no longer the only way you could run something in production, right? Uh, uh, instead of having a Solaris box running in production, we had gone from cheap operating systems or free operating systems, and I was working on a, situ uh, on, a, on a configuration that was basically we were using BSD for our production servers. It had been officially blessed by that point to be production ready. And so my world expanded a little bit from the server to the server, the other server, and my machine. Because now we could afford enough hardware and it was, uh, it was technology was sophisticated enough for our operations tools that we had production, we had staging, and then I had my laptop, which was actually by that point uh, powerful enough that I could do almost all my development locally. So that's how we did things. The developers would all work locally on our workstations. And the development team was responsible for the staging box, and then the DevOps and operations team was responsible for production. And so what that meant is that my tool set had to get considerably bigger than just VI and some shell scripts and CVS, right? So by this point, I have to know a good amount about Mac OS because I'm doing my local development. And on my local development box, all of a sudden, I was running a database and memcache and Apache and all these things locally. I mean, these were things I never had to consider when somebody else had set them up for me in this, you know, the, in the earlier Java environment. But now they were things that on a day-to-day -day basis, I as the developer was responsible for keeping my local workstation up to date. And then we had this staging box that the developers were responsible for, and we used this to test out things like new MySQL drivers, right? Or, uh, or installing some new Apache modules. But then there was this, this little shift where when a product was ready to go out, we had to transition it over to the operations team. And a whole new world of of uh, stress entered my life this way, right? Because all of a sudden, 
I had an environment and then my team had an environment that we had kind of roughly talked about and talked through and stuff like that. All of a sudden, every release, we had to suddenly transfer all of that knowledge to another team of people who had been doing their day job while we were doing our day job. And so they were unaware of all the changes that were coming their way. And so all of a sudden we had to discuss things like, well, how are we going to deliver this software? Are we just going to tar everything up? Is there, are you going to provide us an installer? No, we're going to provide you a run book and you're going to have to walk through that. Okay, well, uh, we just deployed it and everything's broken. Oh, we forgot some driver updates. We just updated MySQL to version whatever, right? Oh, we have shared libraries that are clashing because Ops is running a tool and you guys are running a tool and both of them were asking for a different version of the same library. And dependent, dependency management got hard, debugging got harder, I started using using the excuse, oh, it's broken in production. Uh, well, sorry, it, it works on my machine. I can't tell what's going on in production. Uh, even logging ended up being a point of contention with the operations team for us because we, were, we had constraints on the amount of space and constraints on our I.O. And the developers, we wanted to log all kinds of information that would help us catch and, and solve error conditions. They were primarily interested in telemetry. But we had to agree on the format because it was essentially us you know, using their server. And then, of course, there were the blatantly human problems, like our outage window was 3 AM. Try getting a team of developers and a team of DevOps people in good moods at 3 AM. So now we fast forward again. So by this point, uh, I'm, I'm at HP working on HP Cloud. We've got OpenStack. AWS has really begun to mature. I guess there's this Azure thing somewhere that I hadn't tried at this point. But the big thing we were talking about then was, well, we can virtualize all of this stuff. And suddenly, my little layer cake grew by a whole layer. And this was really kind of uh, my mental model of what I did and how I did it as a developer changed because it used to be the server, and then it was a couple of servers, but now the distinction between server, server was not a big enough term anymore. So I started to understand this world basically like this, right? Okay, so somebody has a bare metal box, and on top of that, uh, they've got the host OS, and its main job, as my, from my developer point of view, is to make sure that the hardware and the software are working together pretty well, and then to provide me a place to run my virtual machine. And I say my, because I was fairly possessive about this, and because this was actually the coolest thing to us, is that all of a sudden we as developers, we got to own the whole virtual machine. So we could pack everything up in an image. And this solved a whole bunch of the problems we had been experiencing in, in that previous life, right? Because now I decided what drivers went on there. We decided what version of the database, how we wanted to do logging and all of this. And in my little developer world, my role became you know, not just running the application, but also setting up the, the, the image. And operations' job was to make sure that that bottom layer was working, and my job was to make sure that the top layer was working. So I traded off some, I, I gained some freedom. My team gained some freedom, but in exchange, we picked up a whole bunch of responsibility that, to be honest, was really starting to push the limits of what we thought our job as software developers was. Suddenly, it wasn't just making sure we had a, you know, a database available to us and we could write SQL, but it was configuring the my.ini file to make sure that our query cache was sufficiently sized, right? And all of a sudden, there was this, we, we had to learn how to build images. And the caching servers were our responsibility to maintain. And in some cases, it was even up to us to figure out how to do the network traffic shaping, which was honestly something that in, the last, in, in previous lives, I had never considered having to do because that was somebody else's job. And then... I mean, to add insult to injury, all of a sudden I was on call because if the virtual machine failed but the host was still fine and the other virtual machines were fine, clearly that was my mistake because the developers ran the VM images. So my tool set just kind of kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and not just as far as the tools I was using when I was working every day but as far as the conceptual overhead that I had to keep track of day in and day out. So now all of a sudden we're talking about not just being able to develop code or even to be able to manage the data layer, 
but building images, moving these large files around, setting up a CI system to build the VM images for us. And then we've got uh, you know, the entirety of OpenStack in one case, or the entirety of AWS in the other. So we've got load balancers that I have to be able to provision, and compute instances, and object storage versus block storage. And then we migrated into a database as a service. And so there were, became all these operational questions about who's responsible for this. And then we're trying to move things into cloud config. And it was like, it just felt like we were being buried in cognitive overhead. I had thought going into this, this was great. We're going to get all this freedom. I can finally configure the things the way I want. But the cost of that to me as a developer was that there was so much stuff I had to keep track of that my, me, the rest of my team is just feeling overwhelmed all the time. You knew I was building up to this slide, right? But don't worry, we solved it with containers. Containers introduced so many things that, that, uh, that just made life much easier, right? Um, the, the promise of containers was that no more could any developer utter, I, maybe this is a promise to ops people, uh, no more will you hear your developers say, it works on my machine, and have that as an excuse because everything was conveniently packaged up. Now, in truth, this was really the same with the VM, but the developers, we like the container model better because we can build them faster. They're much easier to run locally. Uh, we don't have to worry so much about the, the nuances of what the cloud framework is. We can focus on just building this kind of standard format. But what was better than that was that I had been getting, I had been burying myself in the management responsibilities of the tooling that I was using. It was up to me to manage which version of Node.js I had. And I start with a bare VM, and I run all these scripts to do the right installs of things. Well, now all of a sudden, I've got all these Docker images out there that are being maintained by professionals who actually like doing that kind of stuff. And I can just use a from line in my Docker file and pull in the latest and greatest, which happens to be configured the way that the manual says you're supposed to configure it. So I didn't even have to read the manual anymore. So we solved all the problems that we were solving with VMs, right? The, the shared, uh, shared resources thing, stuff like that. They were getting solved. Docker, did, Docker even made things easier by getting rather opinionated about what I was supposed to be running in my container. One of the earliest mistakes we made in VMs was we treated VMs just like they were regular servers, and we were running six, eight different things inside of our VM. It was a very hard line to draw for me, what belongs in the VM and what doesn't. Docker was so opinionated about it, it said you run one major process per, per Docker container, and that was actually like a big relief to us. Oh, good, okay, we know what we're supposed to be doing. And we get some design patterns. The 12-factor model had come out of PaaS, right, but actually applied very, very well in the Docker world. Uh, you inject configuration via environment variables. Yeah, it works in Docker, works on Heroku, right? The whole microservice architecture, Docker was very amenable to that. Again, because they were insistent that this is how you write things in the correct way. And there was sort of this simple economics of the container world that just kind of made sense. They were lighter weight than VMs, which meant we could achieve higher density on things. And even we as developers understood that's actually a big selling point. That's actually uh, very compelling. So it seemed like we had solved a big problem. The problem that had grown up between like my WebMD days and my virtual machine days, right, was that it was getting difficult for me as a developer to say what was in scope for my job. And it was difficult for me as a developer to know what was reasonable to expect of the DevOps team or the operations team. Now all of a sudden it seemed very clear, right? I build a container and that's my deliverable. Seemed very clear because then we added the orchestrator. Because it turned out that Docker was great, and for development, when we were focusing on the microservice, it was great, but we needed a really robust way of running these things in production. And the robust way to run them is to add something like, oh, say, Kubernetes. Kubernetes made my layer cake a lot more complicated. So now all of a sudden, my little conceptual model that started with the server is like, okay, so, down there, there's something that's on hardware. There's hardware somewhere out there. As a developer, I actually don't care anymore about the hardware. It's so far removed, but I know it's down there somewhere. 
Then on top of that, there are probably virtual machines, and those are running my nodes in Kubernetes. And then on top of that, I've got a control plane. And the Kubernetes control plane is doing all of this magical stuff so that when I deploy a container, it gets scheduled somewhere and it's actually executing and then I can verify it. And then on top of that, that's where I put the containers that I just built. So now I'm forced to reparse out again. What on this layer diagram is me and what on this diagram is ops? And it seemed at first very, obvious to me how this whole thing ought to work. It seems so clear. Kubernetes like basically laid it out for me. Operations runs the cluster and Kubernetes gives me this nice contractual interface where it says, you describe to me in 50,000 lines of YAML <laughs> how you run your container and I run it for you. And ops, I mean, it's a, great, it's a great level, right? A great abstraction level. Ops can make sure everything is running up through the kubelets and the, and the DNS server and, and keep monitoring the nodes and things like that. And then developers just describe to Kubernetes how they need their application to run. It seemed very intuitive to me that that would be the right layer of abstraction. So I, as the developer, then take on the job of building the container and describing how it should run. But it turned out that where I thought conceptual overhead was heavy in the virtual machine layer, I had no idea. I still had to know the vast majority of things I learned for working in the VM world, uh, but I gained a new small set of tools like, you know, being able to use Docker directly and Helm and kubectl. Okay, Helm doesn't really count, but you know, I put it up there anyway. Um, but then I got all the Kubernetes concepts. And I think the best way to understand why this is overwhelming is to think about the time you tried to explain to somebody how Kubernetes works. And it goes something like this. Um, so really when it comes down to Kubernetes, what, what you really need to know is you got these things called pods. Sorry, come again, what? Pods. Okay, what's a pod do? Well, a pod's just a simple wrapper around a container. Well, actually, it's one or more containers, but one of the containers you don't really touch. One of them's really supposed to be your main container, but then you have sidecar containers that help the main container do its job, but also there's a special kind called like an init container. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. The important thing is you've got volumes and you've got environment variables and you can inject things into the volumes, but you have to make sure you set up the volume mount so that it shows up in the right place. Oh, and I forgot to tell you about labels. Oh, but anyway, the bottom line is you're probably not gonna directly use pods, right? Because we've got these higher order things called replica sets. They used to be called replication controllers. Actually, replication controllers were different, but replica sets are kind of the same thing. But anyway, oh, and there are stateful sets if you're gonna run a database. Oh, and daemon sets, and I'm not even gonna explain that, but uh, oh, and you, you know, at the end of the day, you don't really run a replica set. You just run a deployment, because a deployment is a higher order object on top of that. But I forgot to tell you that pods are actually kind of disposable, so you shouldn't count on them being there. So you need another set of things like services to make sure that when your pods die and come back up again, they still have an address. Did we talk about configuration there, these config map things and these secrets things? And it goes on and on, and usually by you know two seconds into the pod definition, people are like, ah, oh, can I go back to my thing over there? Uh, it's, it, the conceptual overhead of Kubernetes is hard. We introduced like an entire new dialect to express to people how they run their container in production. I heard uh, someone ex express it this way. You've been telling me all this great stuff about declarative infrastructure, but at the end of the day, your declarative infrastructure feels a little more like 15,000 lines of configuration. I'm going, well, I, I mean, sort of that's the experience. But before it gets better, it actually gets a little bit worse. Because not only is it sufficient to know and understand what all these different resource types do, and to know which ones to pick and choose, it turns out that that little pretty layer cake wasn't nearly as separated as it looked. There were some little porous spots in it. I'm running my application on Minikube. I've got pretty decent file IO on there for my volume that I've got mounted. It rolls into production. All of a sudden, file IO is a major problem. Well, why? Well, because the cloud provider backed my volume storage with this particular system, which is nowhere near as fast as the P9 implementation that's on Minikube. 
So now I have to know about the operational attributes of the cloud system and whether I'm running in AWS or Azure or GKE or on bare metal, I have to understand what the underlying, uh, how the gaps were filled in underneath Kubernetes in order to make the right decisions about when I set up my service, do I choose a load balancer? And is that gonna spin me up a load balancer or is it gonna be a no-op? Because that's a realistic consideration with Kubernetes. Then it gets just slightly more complicated because as we're learning how to actually operate things on Kubernetes, we keep inventing more stuff. And we're solving real problems with this. Service meshes are very cool and they solve a whole class of problems in a very novel way, but they're more complexity. Uh, when Knative came out recently, it was both exciting and horrifying because I as a Kubernetes developer am going, oh, they're solving this problem and this problem and this problem and that's gonna make life better, except that before I can get there, I have to do all of this stuff and configure these tools and make sure I know how to do this and can plug this system in here. We were, again, making that kind of deal where we were trading off simplicity uh, for perceived freedom. Okay, I'm not whining. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like as soon as the speaker says they're not whining, you know they've basically been whining for a while, right? I am really concerned because I think that we need to save people like me from ourselves because we, in order to make Kubernetes the thing that Kubernetes can be, we're going to have to make the developer experience much, much simpler. So here's my thesis here, right? My theory is that all of us here want to come back next year, the year after, 10, 10 years from now, we want to be able to come back to, some, to this event, right? We believe that the container technologies that we're developing now are not what I would call a two-year technology. A two-year technology are those trendy ones that come and go very quickly, and you put it on your resume, and then you scratch it off a couple of years later. There are technologies that last for decades. I firmly believe that what we got with containers and with Kubernetes is a new style of operating system. A way to express, I don't care how many physical machines are under here, but I want to run this kind of workload. Much the same way that in the old style of operating system, we say, I don't really care what the device drivers are, are on this machine, I just want to run my software here. So we've got an operating system sort of writ large, and I think that can be a 10-year technology kind of thing. I think we may have built the class of project that is best represented in things like Linux, where they're just around, they're just everywhere. But we can still screw this up and fail if we don't concentrate on making it easier for people to do. So I think the challenge that those of us have in this room, we're mostly the early adopters, the avant-garde and the people who are willing to kind of take the bullet for other people, right? We learned what a pod was and what a horizontal auto pod, uh, horizontal, uh, I can't even say that one, deployment set, uh, that's a thing. We learn what these things are and then we can help bring other people along. But in order to do this, we have to streamline a lot of what we're doing. So I see basically two big options. There are probably others, but there are two kind of big options that I see. Option A is that we can become insistent that Kubernetes is not actually a developer-oriented thing. So this is very easy. We take that little dotted line and we just bump it up a layer on the layer cake. And we say, all right, you, dear developer, are no longer responsible for explaining to Kubernetes how this is supposed to run. The operations team will handle that. Your job is merely to package everything up in containers. Now, I have seen this done. I know people who are very strong advocates of this position. And I have also seen operations teams employ this strategy with success. But my instinct is that that pattern of success is not gonna become a generic pattern of success, and here's why. Because when we take this approach, we're basically moving backward into that situation I described a little while earlier. 
Think microservice architecture. The developers turn over 5, 11, 17 different microservices that are all expected to work together. If their deliverable is the container, then the situation gets very socially complex again. Because the developers are then responsible for explaining as human beings to human beings, this is how this whole thing is supposed to work together. You just take this and you put it here, you take this, you put it here, you wire these things up. And then we have situations like this. Well, Kubernetes doesn't work that way. You can't just put this here and this here and have them do something together. Well, I didn't know that. We designed this whole application this way. And basically, we're back to that same social class of problems where you start arguing back and forth with good reasons on both sides. This is how it's supposed to run. Sorry, this is how it can run. But we need to do this. Right? You can't do that. You're the volume system we provide is too slow. We need a load balancer here. Oh, our cloud platform doesn't provide a load balancer that meets your requirements. And we've rewound. So I suspect that there might be a second approach that we can take that unfortunately is going to be more work for those of us in this room. But work in service of the 10-year plan, right? Option B is to build better tools. Now, my family has gotten into kind of a slump as far as our TV watching has gone. Uh, if you were to take a poll in my family, the votes would come back pretty much unanimous that favorite show number one is The Great British Baking Show. Favorite show number two is Zumbo's Just Desserts, which is prettier desserts, but in Australia. And show number three is the distinctly American twist on this kind of thing called Nailed It. Has anybody seen Nailed It? Okay, this is a truly embarrassing and truly American show. We take amateur bakers, and by the way, when Americans say amateur, they mean don't know how to cook. <laughs> and they give them a cake that somebody produced on Great British Baking Show, and they say, you have 32 minutes to make this cake. And basically, the person whose cake is the least horrible wins. They're all horrible. It's the least horrible. You know, they're like, well, yours is only mostly tipped over, and the cake is 72% cooked. <laughs> but what we're learning about this as a family is that uh, when you build layer cakes, there's a lot of this structural stuff, right? We built a layer cake in Kubernetes and Docker and virtual machines. But as you know from watching these shows, right, you don't decorate, you don't put the decorations on top of the layer cake without first frosting the cake. You cover it with buttercream or fondant, or fondant, uh, and, and then you put the decorations on top. Well, I feel like that's actually not a bad analogy for what I think we're, the, the mistake we're making is, which is that we're insisting that developers use the unfrosted cake. And so you need to be aware of all the structural issues going on down here. I think we can actually provide a better, uh, better layer where we start to treat things like Kubernetes resource format, the Kubernetes manifests, as sort of like what Brennan Burns would call an assembly language, right? So what practically does that actually mean, right? And this is kind of the, the, the challenge. This is, this is why I'm here. Because I think that all of that is basically telling a good story that ends in this. What tools do we actually need to build to, to compel new developers to move into this landscape? The first one, I think, is debugging. Uh, my team works very hard on trying to solve debugging problems because we had this horrifying realization that it was easier to debug a program in the 1980s than it is today. We have too many layers of abstraction between the local developer's experience and the thing that they want to debug that's running somewhere out there. And we let those layers of abstraction get in our way, and we didn't even turn around and look what we'd done until we got here, and we're going, hmm, debugging, that yeah, would be nice. You would think that, according to the way that technology works, debugging would be like automatic by now, right? You wouldn't think, how do I set up my debugger, let alone how do I make enough holes in my network and enough holes in this infrastructure so that I can get from my local VS code to something running out there in a container. So that's a good case where we kind of failed the developer. Rails, I think, the number one takeaway from Rails 
is that they understood an approach to software development that pulled people in. And it was this, build a blog in 15 minutes. Yes, we mean build a blog. Okay, I built a blog, this is awesome. Do I understand how I built it? No, I opened this models file and this controller file and entered some stuff, but I've got a foothold. I built something that works. I think I can actually build other things that work even though I don't understand yet. And then you start to back into the knowledge, right? Today, I'm gonna go see what this active record thing is. And you kind of back in and you look around and you say, okay, all right, this makes sense. Contrast that with the Kubernetes experience where I was just trying to tell you how to, what a pod is, right? That's not a backing in experience. That's a, you have to understand all of this before you can get hello world done sort of experience. So I think there's gotta be a way in which we can put abstract, uh, not abstract, I don't wanna call it an abstraction layer. I wanna call it like, um, an accessibility layer for developers so that they can get started with this stuff and have the sort of blog in 15 minutes experience and then later learn what a pod is or the difference between storing stuff in a config map or a secret. And I think some of that is just done by merely hiding operational ex abstraction layers from them so they don't have to be aware of this at all. I think uh, packaging is another one that I'm particularly passionate about. Um, we had a goal with Helm to, to the, the, the user story that we spent the most amount of time on, the user story we considered Helm a failure if it didn't solve is this. If you've got a Kubernetes cluster, you should be able to stand up your first application in five minutes. That was our user story. As a user, I want to stand up my first application in five minutes. We solved it, but only in regards to the Kubernetes manifest files. But we know already that that's uh, sort of underwhelming, right? We've got images that we need to manage and, uh, and, and additional tooling that is involved in standing up and tearing down software. And Helm, we basically have said, well, you're on your own for that stuff. We'll solve the manifest problem for you. So there's a bigger story that we need to get better on telling if we're gonna tell our developers, this is how you deliver something into Kubernetes. And the last one, is that I think if we're gonna take this 10-year technology mindset, we have to switch our focus a little bit from trying to introduce new layers and introduce new complexity towards stepping back and saying, how do we make this elegant? How do we make it feel ergonomic to the developer that's coming into this? And that's a mindset change, right? That will, I think, when we, if we can successfully make that, and I speak for myself here, if we can successfully make that transition in mindset, all of a sudden, this slide will look like, you know, just a couple of random ideas and we'll have all these other things where we say, oh yeah, we could solve this problem, we could do this, we could really help developers that way. So at the end of the day, the main concern for those of us in this room, I think, is that we have found something that we can passionately advocate because we see the number of problems it's solving. But we have to be mindful of what we're doing to the developers who are just getting into this field. The developers who are what we would call, you know, the, the mainstream, right? We wanna tell them, here's a workflow for you. But telling them there's a workflow for them is not the same as telling them, look, we have a workable workflow, something that is going to be a delight to use. That's where I think we need to go from here. Thank you very much.